Hey, y'all. Uh, so great to have you here. Um, we're really excited for this event today with Brendan Burns. Uh, we're talking about LinkedIn, uh, getting uh, coaching clients on LinkedIn, five to eight high ticket coaching clients. I'm going to start out with a really quick little bit of housekeeping as we dive in. Um, you'll notice a couple of things. Number one, there's a really awesome chat down there. It says, say something nice, at least for, for me in the lower right, right hand corner. Uh, I love that we have folks that are chiming in from what looks like all over the world. We have Austin, Texas, Slovakia, Ohio, Lisbon. Uh, let us know where you're at. Uh, throw a little hey down there. Uh, I love to see where our community is joining us from. Um, as the as the discussion today goes on, uh, I'd also love for you to drop your questions either in the chat box or where it says ask a question as well down there in the in the bottom for me. So um, the way this is, is really gonna be structured, I'm gonna do a really quick intro for myself. Brendan's gonna intro himself as well. And then we're gonna dive into the content. We're also gonna spend time at the very end for Q and A. And so as the discussion goes on and you have questions, um, throw them in there in real time. We might pick them up, we might not. If we don't pick them up, we'll ask them at the very end um, to make sure that you get everything answered uh, but we're super appreciative that you all are here. Um, this is going to be a really awesome event. I'm Jeremy uh, from Practice. I get the pleasure of talking to uh, a lot of our, the coaches in our community um, about all things coaching. And, and our goal is to bring really awesome content to our community around everything from coaching strategy to building your business as a coach to how you run your, your coaching business operationally. Um, so really excited for this event today. Uh, I'll stop talking because you guys are here to see Brendan. Uh, and listen to Brendan. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Brendan, and uh, take it away. All right, Jeremy, thanks so much for the introduction. I just love seeing all these people here from New Zealand, Portugal, Sydney, UK, South Africa, Belgium, Greece, and uh, Northern Virginia. So many cool places people you guys are coming in from. Um, the topic that I want to share with you guys today is on how I leverage um, LinkedIn to get high ticket coaching clients. So basically, how to get five to eight per month. We book anywhere from 20 to 30 calls every single week using LinkedIn, no ad spend, getting people on calls, getting them signed up for high ticket coaching. And there's no, like I said, ad spend or complex technology required to do this. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. So I used to work in finance, kind of hated the day job, wanted to become a coach, super excited for something I was more passionate about. But unfortunately, I didn't realize that getting clients was actually kind of challenging for me. I just assumed that once I decided I was going to become a coach, then it would all kind of like work out and everything would be fine. But I had no idea how to actually get meetings set up, how to find clients, how to set up discovery calls. And I just lived in sort of fear and anxiety for way too long. By the way, can you guys just say yes in the chat if you can see my uh, my slides okay while I'm sharing that? Or Jeremy, if you want to chime in there. Yes. Okay, sweet. So um, long story. Oh, go ahead. You're good to go. I'm just saying. Good. Perfect. So yeah, I wanted to share with you everything that we do specifically on LinkedIn. So um, now we're making anywhere from like 70 to uh, 90, $100,000 per month in coaching revenue um, with me, like one other coach and uh, one or two people helping out with sales conversations now. So very lean team, bringing a lot of revenue in. And I would say the vast majority of it has been coming um, over the past year, multiple years from LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, if you want a steady stream of clients, you want to be able to host retreats in Costa Rica, you want to have time to blow up your own podcast and not just kind of worry about the money or where you're going to get coaching clients. Um, just kind of follow the lead on what we've been doing here. Um, had, have had some pretty cool people on my podcast, the Brendan Burns show. We've had Matthew McConaughey, Jack Canfield. It's given me the opportunity to travel the world. And then also, you know, one thing I'm not going to touch on as much, but we've also converted this because we get so many clients on LinkedIn now from being a one-on-one -on -one coach to doing a high ticket hybrid model where we kind of support our clients in more of a group setting while also giving them some one-on-one -on -one support as well. So you can see my old calendar on the left and my new calendar on the right. This is for sure my last call of the day. It is 12.05 PM here in, uh, in San Diego where I'm based. And, uh, yeah, so super excited to spend the rest of my day today with my fiance and just kind of hang out and enjoy. So the three things we're going to sort of cover here are, first of all, how to kind of engage in conversations with people on LinkedIn, how to actually reach out, how to build a list, how to find kind of who the ideal person is for you. Second secret is how to what copy to actually use to transfer them from LinkedIn onto a call as quickly as possible with the understanding that this is for them to kind of potentially get coaching from you. And then the third secret is 
that you don't have to be an expert. And I'll walk you through each step. So these are the four categories on LinkedIn that we use to narrow down finding our ideal client. Job title, <clears throat> what degree connection they are, where they're based, and how many years they've been in their current company. So for us specifically, um, we target coaches. That's one of the things that we help people with is we help coaches get more clients and build their business. But having a job title that you search for on LinkedIn is super important. One of the things I always recommend, think about who your last four clients have been or are currently. Say your two best clients, four best, most recent clients. Go actually pull up their LinkedIn profile. If you pull it up, you'll see what their job title is and you can search for that. For example, for us specifically, we do really well with executive coaches or leadership coaches or even business coaches, but ideally kind of executive coach tends to work better for us than say a life coach or, um, you know, I don't know, just like other types of coaches just based on historically who we've helped. So getting the job title right, super, super important. Also, <clears throat> if you have not yet figured out kind of your niche or your job title, that's also okay. You can run multiple LinkedIn outreach campaigns to different slivers of the world um, and then sort of narrow down what's going to work best for you. For example, we used to um, target uh, small business owners, CEOs, managing partners, presidents of organizations, and also online coaches. We found that the coaches um, were much better for us because they had more social media experience. They leveraged social and LinkedIn more. They were more willing to hop on a Zoom call. They knew what Zoom was. They knew what Calendly was. They were responsive. So we tested out different niches on LinkedIn before we found out which one to actually scale and, and drive more traffic to. <clears throat> the second topic is uh, second degree connection. So uh, when people reach out to new people on LinkedIn, they don't always do this, but you really want to reach out to people who are a second degree connection within your existing network. You'll find much higher acceptance rates, much more trust between the two people. And also your second degree net will expand over time as you build more second degree connections. So then your pool will get larger. But when we do these campaigns, we definitely don't do third degree or third plus degree connections. We go for second degree connections on LinkedIn. That allows us to, when we add someone and send a connection request to a new person, I'll say, oh, Brendan also knows Sarah or Brendan also knows Jeremy. That's cool. More willing to connect, more willing to engage, more willing to have a dialogue and a conversation. Third step is geography. Um, can I just get in the chat one more time, like where everyone's based? I'd love to just see some fresh uh, locations again. Um, just drop in the chat where you're tuning in from right now. Because what I'm noticing uh, on LinkedIn is that we just have such a sort of di variety of people that we could potentially connect with. So we got Montreal, we got Spain, California. We're in California, Lisa. Um, we got Virginia, Philly. So, so yeah, we got people all over. And obviously, so as you guys see, like we could be working with coaches from literally anywhere in the world, Slovakia, um, Sydney, Australia. And, you know, we've had kind of like opportunities, but also challenges um, working with people in different time zones and countries. And like, for example, sometimes we offer financing to clients if they don't have a budget to potentially pay for uh coaching like on an existing credit card that they have. And so that works a lot better for us, the people of the United States. Um, sometimes when we pitch coaching to people in Australia because of the conversion rate, it can be challenging. So thinking about geography is super important, but um, shout out to John Kuntz, um, former client over here, because people in Ohio actually do uh, really well with us. And we have like a lot of clients kind of based in the Midwest who are just kind of like great clients. They're a lot nicer in my experience um, than like when we target people from like New York City or California. We've had some different like challenges with people in the Bay Area, for example. So the, the geography of who you're gonna work with is super important and you can target that uh, on LinkedIn on the free search, but then especially with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, you can really hone it down to even zip codes. So really, really cool that you can do that. But here's another thing. When I moved to Newport Beach, California during the pandemic from New York City, I then just targeted people in Newport Beach and I, the outreach copy that I used, it said, hey, what's going on? Um, so you popped up on my LinkedIn. So we had a few mutual connections. I just moved here from I moved from New York City to Newport. Would love to connect, hop on Zoom or grab a coffee. And that worked really well too because it was more of an authentic message. I wasn't trying to sell them anything, but I was also showing them that we had something in common. So I always say this for LinkedIn in general, you know, where are you actually based geographically? What college did you go to? What could you have in common with someone else that you can reach out to them on LinkedIn and connect over? So it's not like a cold sales pitch, but it's like, hey, like love to connect with a fellow Cornelian, kind of what are you up to, that type of stuff. 
Um, and then the last thing that's really good for us that I'd recommend everyone do is like how many years into the, the role that they play um, are, do you typically like to work with someone for? So for example, we do help. I mean, I just signed up a new client this morning. Awesome guy comes from the military background, um, leaving the military, wants to start his own coaching business. And so he's brand new and we can definitely help brand new coaches. Don't get me wrong. Like, obviously I've done that for myself and we've helped many, many other people with that, but we do also really do well with people who are in that kind of three to eight year range. So what we do of like already being a coach. So what we did was, again, we have, I have a spreadsheet with all my clients and past clients and all different columns to like understand the demographics. And so for this category specifically, I know I look at all our clients and I do an average and a median of how many years they've been at their company on their LinkedIn profile. And then I also do the same thing um, for past clients as well. Oh, oh, no, what I was really gonna say is, out of my existing clients, I take like my five best ones and I look at the average date and I'm like, okay, how long have they been at their company for? Um, or like in this role. And then I can search and kind of create like a targeted campaign as lookalike as possible to my existing best clients. So think about years in current company when you're kind of building your LinkedIn list and avatar. And the cool thing about LinkedIn is you can do a lot of this for free. Like you don't need sales navigator to, uh, you go basically into the search bar, you click on people and then you search for the job title. And then from there, you'll have the ability to kind of add these additional features in. Um, so you can do it as well. Like for example, I think if I just kind of go to LinkedIn and I put in, I've been logged in because I have my team do this now for me, but you go in and then if I just in the top, you just put in coach and then people and then you can add in the other filters we talked about as well so like connections second degree locations like we talked about um, but you could pull up all filters and it looks like there's a lot here i don't know for sure <clears throat> the years in current company might actually be um, a sales navigator feature only um, but everything else you can do on the free search so definitely recommend that for kind of building your list now Here's something that's really important is when you send your initial connection request to a new person that you're not yet connected to, you want to attach a message to that. So the way to do that, if you don't know, is when you click connect, you add a note. And this is like the most important thing because I feel like 70% of like me actually getting a call set up with someone starts right here by me putting a question into this uh, thread. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something like, you know, I'm definitely not selling anything and I'm definitely, I'm definitely not trying to like, you know, get too in the weeds with like a long message that's going to push them away. I usually will say something like, Hey, Sean, um, you know, would be great to connect. Uh, what type of coaching are you, are you focused on right now? And what that does is it kind of looks like more, and I can like automate this with a tool that we have, um, but you can do it manually too. And it shows it's like, you know, the lowercase h, this looks like less robotic. I'm asking them a question. You can maybe capitalize this, but I'm keeping it short, sweet, concise, and I'm genuinely interested in them and the relationship. When I do client creation, there's like slow game and long game or fast game, like the super fast game is like, and this would be a topic for another time I, I teach is like kind of how to use an ad funnel, how to get people like on Google search or Facebook IG ads. Like they see your ad, they click, they fill out the form, they hop on a call. You can sign them up on one call, one call close. The LinkedIn thing is super cool because you can make a lot of money, you can get a lot of clients and you don't have to spend anything on ads and it's pretty straightforward. You don't need landing page, you don't need an ads manager, you don't have to spend money on ads. But with LinkedIn, you want to play it a little bit slower. You want to get to know them, and build a bit of a relationship first. I don't like to do a ton of back and forth in the LinkedIn with messaging because you'll lose the opportunity to get them on a call. But once you get them on a call, you kind of slow play it. You get to know them a little bit. You figure out if they actually have a desire to grow or have a need. And then you use that first call to kind of reframe the intention of the second call. And you either uh, sell them on the second or third call. But in the messages, I like to ask a short, provocative, quick question, not selling anything. But again, really important, get a question out attached to that first connection request. And then if they don't um, respond, we'll do a drip follow-up messages sequence, like usually two more spaced out over another couple of weeks at least. And they'll say something like, hey, still would like to chat and connect or um, just bump in the following message, like last message or like checking in. 
Um, and then you can, from there, get a call set up. But secret number two is how to book calls with the LinkedIn leads. So um, we like to be obviously very aggressive with our calendaring. Um, we don't try to, uh, so we don't send calendar links. That's really important is we'll just, they'll say something like, oh, hey, Brendan, thanks for reaching out. Right now, I'm kind of focused on leadership coaching for, um, you know, VPs of sales in large organizations. And then I'll, I might say something like, oh, that's cool. I was actually just talking to a guy last week who's a VP of sales um, who, you know, we're going to be helping out, uh, you know, and then I'll ask one more question. Usually just like would love to sort of take this off and, and kind of connect on a Zoom. Um, we usually go for it pretty quickly because people don't really use LinkedIn the same way they use Facebook and Instagram DMs. Like LinkedIn is almost, in my experience, more like an email cadence. Like it takes longer to do a lot of back and forth. So I'll usually just kind of go for a call right there. But then when I propose the call, we they're not like, oh, yeah, share a calendar link. I'll usually just say like, yeah, happy to share a link. But kind of what time, you know, it's Monday now. I'd be like, yeah, what time's good for you? Like Wednesday, Thursday. And we just nail it down live, um, like in the direct messages. So, um, but we also have like a lot of different kind of like, this is all for my now uh, setter appointment setter team because they've really dialed this in like to a, to a T. So we have, they, they, I didn't even know, I haven't even seen this, but apparently um, when like they have like a low word count, um, they'll say something like, we'll say this, but then if they're more kind of engaging with us and giving us like a better, um, like they're like more like, oh yeah, like thanks so much for reaching out. Because like if it's like they respond to the message and they're like, I'm a life coach. You can tell they're like a little jaded, a little bit like, what are you trying to sell me? A little bit of like, you know, not not as necessarily going to be a good lead higher word count you can get a little bit more personalized you can give them a little bit more text going on um you can kind of like give them an extra compliment type thing so we actually will kind of our reply will be sort of best um it will determine it based on kind of the, like what we're getting from them um now obviously we say connect with my team but for you guys you can just i mean i'm assuming most people here are kind of like running their own sort of like uh coaching practice right um so, so yeah, I'm just going to look at the chat here though. So yeah, um, I definitely want to address this because yeah, so people, yeah, so it's interesting. I, I've seen some of the comments here. Um, really just don't want to be like very leading and salesy. Like the, the whole goal is to really just kind of build a, a genuine relationship. Um, and the thing about the LinkedIn is, uh, well, yeah, Joe, it might be played out for you, but we're still making a lot of money on it. So the mistake that people make is they're not building a relationship genuinely first. Like our desire is to actually add these people all into our network and have a conversation that's either like, we're going to help you out, you're going to help us out, or we're just in each other's network and you don't go for the sale first. That's the reason why people um, are, are not really like having success the way we are on LinkedIn is because it's just too salesy. Um, the way to be genuine is to actually look at their profile and kind of like get a vibe for who they are and come up with some things that you want to learn more about them and build a real relationship. The The problem that people have with LinkedIn is they just see these profiles as just like units for sale and not as people. So for example, if I were at a networking event, which is kind of how I built my business the first 20K a month in coaching clients, I'd go up to people, ask them questions, get to know them, hear their pain points, and then maybe build a relationship or maybe offer some coaching to them. I try to use LinkedIn the same way. Just kind of understand where they're at, who they are, ask them questions, see if they're open to conversation and go from there. Um, so hopefully that answers some of the questions because yeah, it seems like there's a little skepticism around um, LinkedIn and I, I hope you guys know that it is definitely working for us. Um, yeah. All right, so um, just kind of going back to the slides here. Um, you know, if if someone, if someone asks for the purpose of the call, because again, this is like kind of what we run into is people are like, well, what's the, you know, or is this a sales pitch? And again, because it's genuinely not, this is like an open net. Like if we're looking to be super direct and kind of like turn people into clients immediately, obviously we can spend more money on ads. But the nice thing about LinkedIn is we can just look, say, hey, like we're just looking for ways to support one another. And then if that doesn't kind of work for them, then that's totally fine. But again, obviously with that intention set, you're going to have people who um, are going to be a little wary of the sales call. And that's why, again, you want to lead with the relationship. Um, 
if the prospect drops a, their calendar link to find a time, we typically just book it um, and then we'll hop into their Zoom room. Um, but if it's possible to kind of control the conversation and do it in our Zoom room, um, then yeah, we'll just go in that direction. So um, yeah, that's kind of it in terms of the LinkedIn uh script here um is it better to just be upfront and direct um yeah i mean we've we've split tested kind of both and both work for us honestly um we'll say like yeah like we help um they'll say I'll, they'll say oh this type of coach angel be like cool yeah we definitely help uh like what i like to do actually is just be like oh nice how's that going or like what's kind of your biggest challenge with that and then they'll say like oh you know i'm just really like really having a hard time like getting new clients or like getting people signed up on sales calls and then you can say something like, yeah, man, like, I definitely understand and I've experienced that before. Um, would you be open to a 15 minute Zoom call where I can share some things that have been working for us in that area? Um, and then they'll say yes and then you just book the call. So there's definitely like more direct versus like more like slow play approaches to that. Um, but yeah, um, that's kind of my experience. I find it hard to see, rephrase all this for target. I find it hard to see how to rephrase all this for target clients that are working in the corporate world. Yeah. I mean, so this is obviously for coaches specifically, like one thing that we do with our clients is we kind of customize copy based on like that, who they're reaching out to. So it really depends. Like if it's someone in corporate, you might want to ask them like how they're like, what's been the highlight of your year so far, or like what's the biggest challenge you're facing or like great to connect. How do you know? So-and-so if you have a second degree connection, um, yeah, Beverly, there's there's always going to be resistance to calls for sure. Um, I think that coaches are probably a bit more open to networking, but that's normal. That's that's part of the the sort of process here. Um, but yeah, and then kind of like we have some information for sure on like how to kind of navigate having those conversations. Like once you hop on the Zoom, how do you build rapport? How do you kind of like qualify people, see if they're a good fit, transition it from networking into a sales call if they're open to it. Um, so we can definitely share more information about that. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Um, I'll just throw up a link super quick for anyone who, um, did see value in this and, and wants to kind of learn more about our strategy. Um, it's brendanhburns.com slash book. Um, Jeremy, feel free to kind of hop in whenever you're ready. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but if anyone kind of wants to have a conversation with me and my team to sort of learn more about what we're doing there, how we're making, you know, 80 to hundred K a month with this LinkedIn approach, definitely feel free to hit me up. Cool. Um, awesome, Brendan. So this is a good time uh, as far as questions go. If folks have recordings, uh, Sylvia, or questions, sorry, answering your questions, Sylvia, how, where, we will put the recording on YouTube. We'll also email a link out, um, but let's get into some questions. So uh this one from loose so brennan i'm interested to know how slash when you scaled from doing this yourself to having a team do it for you yeah that's such a good question um basically i got kind of to my first 10 or 20k a month in coaching revenue through personal relationships in-person networking and then i added on the linkedin just kind of like on the side to help scale it a little bit and then really once i was ready to turn on the jets so I'm kind of like at 10 to 20 K a month wanting to grow faster, more scalable beyond kind of like my ability to target in-person events. And so what I did was I started just kind of doing this all myself. So I started by doing it manually. Um, then I kind of added some automation to the process to sending the initial messages, but I was still like calendaring everything myself and taking all the calls. I realized very quickly that taking these calls um, was not sort of my strongest area to add value. I'm much more of like a marketer and uh, a coach than like a sales guy. And so I did a few things. First thing was I put in an appointment setter, commission only, who would take the calls on my behalf. So that's why you see a lot of the copy say, would love to kind of connect and hop on a call with my team. And then from there, I would set those calls to Shannon and she would handle the first conversations and like kind of sift through like, you know, all the calls we were setting and then take the good ones and push them over to my calendar and I would meet with them and then, you know, two call close them typically. Um, the DMs were very exhausting though. And it took a lot of time and energy. And then, um, so what I did now was I have a virtual assistant who does that. And when did I introduce him was probably like a few months later. I think I like did my own direct messaging for a few months and then I was like, okay, I know the process. I know how to do it. Now it's time to kind of shift it to someone else. 
And so I had this other guy come in and he started doing it. And, and like I played around with like virtual assistant agencies, virtual assistants in the Philippines. I think the best thing is to have a virtual assistant part time. You can pay hourly in the United States to do this for you. Um, because for us, our approach is like very relationship, very good communication, very good rapport, and also like well written. Like I didn't want someone like making grammatical mistakes and not doing the right job with this. So I would say very early on into the process, I got someone to take these first round calls with me. And then like a few months later, I had a virtual assistant come in and do the the calendaring of the appointments for me. Got it. That's great. Um, this one from Trevin. How do you feel about LinkedIn ads? Has that been worth it for you? What's your take on those? Yeah, so um, never have officially run them yet. And the reason why is because with this strategy, we're booking, you know, there have been weeks where we've booked, I think, 28 or more calls per week running this off of two LinkedIn accounts, mine and another. And so there just really hasn't been a need to do that yet. And I've just based on my friends and my experience, like I've spent a lot of money, like tens, if not hundreds of thousands, not hundreds, but like I've spent a lot of money on Facebook ads, on Instagram ads over the years. And so Facebook, IG, Google, like I spent a lot of money. And from my experience, LinkedIn ads are pretty expensive for cost per client acquisition, cost per lead. And there's different ways to run LinkedIn ads. You can do like direct message ads where like they get a sponsored DM from you, or you can do like feed ads. Um, so again, I mean, you could test it out, but just kind of in my experience of leveraging this process, we book so many calls that we don't even have capacity to take on more calls where we would spend money. And we've also dialed in Google search ads really well. Um, so we can just spend more money there. But, um, uh, I know that, uh, I know of some people who are doing LinkedIn ads right now. I don't know how well they're going. Um, I think there's probably an opportunity because it's probably less understood than Facebook ads. Um, I'm experiencing that just with Google ads, like running these Google ads is cool because it's like a much less competitive space. I feel like than Facebook and Instagram world, um, at least for coaches. So, you know, I'm always interested in like trying new things. Like we, we tried some TikTok ads a few months ago and it didn't fully work out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can give it a shot. I just, I would try this first though, because there's no ad spend associated with it. For sure. Um, this one from Joe, how much do you charge and what's the range? How much do I charge for my coaching services? Yes, I believe so. Joe can, you can comment Joe, if you have something in the, to clarify there, but yeah, let's start there. Yeah, for sure. So we, everything we do is customized and really kind of depends on who we're working with. Um, well, we kind of help our clients charge. Like typically we like to get our clients up to at least a thousand dollars a month per client that they work with. But we're also big on helping clients structure high ticket offers anywhere from five to fifteen thousand um, dollars. And that could be over the span of six months. Um, but we really help them kind of like craft a higher value, better results driven offer at a higher price point. Um, but yeah, usually like if we have a client, we try to get them to at least a thousand thousand a month, eight clients. That's about six. That's about 100k a year. Six figures is where we like to start, and then just kind of take people up from there. Cool. Okay, this one from um, from Sylvia. Uh, kind of going back to that initial message, but how can mm -hmm. you be genuine with someone you don't know? What are your? Can you just restate some of your tactics for that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, like I try to treat this kind of like online dating. You know, so you're basically how genuine can you be in an online dating situation, right? You see some pictures, you see some interests, but maybe there's something like when I was doing, it's funny because I met my fiance on an online dating app and um, one of my friends who had a lot of experience with this was telling me, he's like, just find kind of one thing on their profile that resonates with you that you maybe have an interest in as well or shared experience or something where you'd be curious to learn more about that. That's also why if you go onto my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that we brought in a professional writer um, who we refer out to some of our clients who spent several hours interviewing me and then writing this professional about section for me. So um, essentially this bio has a lot of stuff in here and I definitely recommend you guys take a look and then kind of make your own about sections that have a lot to offer. 
But this is a good area where we'll look on other people's profiles and look for something that we might ha kind of have in common with them. So I could try to kind of pull up an example here. Um, you know, so right off the bat, Atlanta, I was in Atlanta in 2019, went to the Super Bowl, had a lot of fun. I thought it was super cool. I'll, I'll look at mutual connections and say, oh, wow, like she also knows um, Rachel. Like, you know, I used to live in New York. How do you know Rachel? Do you know her well? Is that just kind of like you can make a joke about it? It's like, oh, is that actually like a real connection or is that just like a virtual friend? Um, you could look at their featured section or their activity, you know, like look at one of their posts. You can play this and be like, Hey, you know, I listened to this. Now, I think it's always much more genuine to like actually listen to it because I get a lot of people who um for to try to pitch themselves to come on my podcast. Or we have these like there's a lot of like agencies now that like you pay money and they'll like reach out to a ton of podcasters and try to get you booked on shows. So I have a lot of people who do that reach out to me and they're always like, Hey, Brandon, like I was just listening to episode 43 on this. And so it's now like even that's become a little kind of jaded. So I think if you can really just like be genuine, I feel like just to kind of put myself in the other person's shoes as the podcaster, I would appreciate if someone, you know, sometimes people leave five star reviews for me. That's happened a few times. I really like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that will make me more likely to take a call. Um, you know, so some people do endorse other people on LinkedIn and then they'll be more willing to kind of like engage with them. But I would just say, again, try to treat it like, you are like walking up to them at a networking event. Like, what would you ask them? What would you say to them? How, like, why would you want to get to know them better? Mm -hmm. um, you know, here, this woman has a pretty strong about section. So you can definitely kind of dig in on this and ask some questions like, oh, how did you get into working with people in STEM or finance? Like, I actually used to work in finance myself. Oh, I see you did too. So you really, I mean, University of Alabama, like I've been to all 50 states. I've been to Alabama. I have an Alabama blanket downstairs. So you just kind of like, you look at that and you look for kind of connection points where you can find some kind of common ground. And then you dig in on that. Got you. Thanks. Um, this one from Lucas, what was your target audience before you started coaching coaches? Yeah. I mean, it was always kind of like entrepreneurs and people who wanted to live that sort of like four hour work week lifestyle. I read the Tim Ferriss book for work week when I was in graduate school and I loved it. Um, I would say initially, like I took the leap out of finance in New York to become a coach. And so I was coaching a lot of people who were scared to take the leap. So I was taking like entrepreneur clients on people who wanted to quit their job and do something different. And I had already kind of taken that step to get there. Then I started selling online courses and running Facebook ads and doing like understanding teachable and course fulfillment. And then a lot of people start hiring me for that. And then I started doing more coaching and then people start hiring me for that. But I think kind of the root of it was I do have an MBA. I did work as an investment banker and at a hedge fund. So I had a lot of kind of like finance and business experience. So I think I was always kind of like doing business coaching from day one, just kind of serving slightly different audiences. So, you know, when I coach coaches, I'm mostly helping them with marketing and sales. So getting more calls booked, getting the right type of client enrolled on sales calls. So at the end of the day, I feel like I've always just kind of been a business coach and I've served different types of people. I did enjoy working with small business owners. They had large organizations. They I was able to impact more people, larger, not like you know hundreds of employees. But I definitely, I've worked with them as well. But I think at the end of the day, it's mostly been business coaching with a life coaching approach underneath it. Got it. Awesome. Um, this one from Beverly. Uh, when we talk about automation, what does your stack look like in terms of automation? Like what, what do you use today? Um, are you connecting things with Zapier? Like what does that look like? Yeah, I love Zapier. So one of the things that I really like that we do, I mean, we do a bunch of things with Zapier, but one is when someone actually um, signs up for coaching with us and we just had a guy this morning <clears throat> that I signed up, I pop his email into the Teachable and it's connected with Zapier. So Teachable is where we have the video content associated with working with us. But then they get the email onboarding sequence from Keep with all the drip emails. They also, I have a Zap set up through uh, DocuSign as well. So the contract gets automatically sent to them. So I'm sure, you know, Jeremy, in practice, your, your SaaS mm -hmm. tool like does a lot of this as well. Yeah. So I've had to kind of like figure it out on my own before I knew about you guys. Mm -hmm. But that's one of my favorite Zap automations. Another one that I really like is when someone opts in to our um, ad landing page. Uh, through the Google ads, 
it takes their name, first name, last name, and email and phone number and puts it in a spreadsheet for my appointment setter. And so every day he sees all the leads in that Google sheet and then he can go and dial all those people. Cause let's say like, you know, 30 people opt in a day and maybe three or four book a call directly onto one of our calendars. But the other, you know, 27 people, Brendan will call them up and he'll get another two to three booked just by dialing those phone numbers and getting them on the calendar with us. So that's another zap that we like. There are pretty complicated and advanced LinkedIn zaps that we've used in the past. Um, I don't like them though, because I don't like to take someone's email address from like a first degree connection and just put them on my email list. I don't see a lot of value there and it can kind of bother people obviously. So I don't really use a lot of zaps with LinkedIn. What we do do though, is if someone books a call, we'll put them in through our one sub, which is what we use for calendar and call appointments, kind of like Calendly. And then from there, that'll send them into keep into our email CRM. And so if like a week and a half goes by, they'll start getting emails to rebook the call unless they've already had it. So we kind of have like a diversion thing in keep, like haven't taken a call yet, have, but haven't like signed them up for coaching yet, or we have signed them up for coaching and they're getting the onboarding emails. So yeah, I'm a big fan of different SaaS tools. I know, again, I know practice yeah. you guys do a lot of that heavy lifting with your product, but um, those are some of the things that I use. Cool. Um, we have, uh, there's a couple, there's a couple different kinds of questions about this, but uh, maybe I'll try and summarize these ones to take to the same queue. Can you talk a little bit about just like the volume of, of funnels and maybe throughputs? It's like there was a comment from Trevin where he said, you know, I send about 125 uh, LinkedIn connections per week. You know, can you talk about maybe reverse engineering the funnel and and just like what kind of volume do you need at the top to try and get to the volume at the bottom? Do you have any any thoughts there? Yeah, so we we do about the same as Trevin. Um, like, what well, the the thing that we do really well that I didn't really talk about today is um, we really optimize our um, my profile. So if you go through my profile, kind of in more detail, um, can I share? The yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just said unshared, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, so if you go to my profile on LinkedIn there's a number of things that I've done to kind of increase the response rate and everything. So good, clean headshot, title, name, um, the header image, featured podcast guests I've had on, um, the about section, featured YouTube podcast episodes, detailed work experience, education, all my endorsements, recommendations. So I've put a lot of time and effort into my profile because what happens is when someone sends when you send someone a connection request, the first thing they're typically going to do is be like, oh, who is this person? They're going to look at your profile. They might say, what did he say? Who is he connected with that I'm connected with? But also, who is he? And so they're going to go to your profile. And this is why you want to have a really good optimized profile. Most people make the mistake of reaching out to a lot of people. And then they click on your profile and they're like, oh, I don't really see anything interesting here. I don't really want to connect with this person. I mean, you can send, there's always going to be people who will accept your connection requests. But we typically shoot for like, you know, a large, like very high conversion rates. Like we're typically trying to get, um, we're typically trying to get like 20 to 40% of people that we send invites to accepting. And then like 10 to 20% of those people responding to our messages. And so what we do kind of even when we're working with our clients is we're trying to optimize every step of the process of like, okay, if people aren't responding to your connection requests, like, are you hitting people that are not active on LinkedIn? Cause there are ways in sales navigator to search for people who have posted in the last 30 days, or you can create a campaign of people who have commented on a post of someone like similar to your niche. So for example, I could run a campaign and reach out to people who are commenting with it on a Tony Robbins post within the last week. I know those mm -hmm. people are interested in personal development coaching and they're super active on LinkedIn. That'll boost your connection request acceptance rate. And then if the connection request rate is fixed, but the DM reply rate is low, then it's, what are you saying to these people? It's probably too long, too salesy, too much about you, not about them, not about the relationship. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do, yeah, about the same as Trevin in terms of invites. Um, but on top of that, we'll also maybe get into one LinkedIn group and just send messages to people in the group that we're not directly connected with because you can do that with a much broader limit um, on LinkedIn. And so that'll maybe get us, you know, another five or six calls per week on top of the 15 to 20 we're getting through the connection requests. Awesome. Uh, this one from Claudia. 
can you talk a bit more about um, your program and how you guys help coaches that are just starting? Yeah, for sure. So kind of the, the four <clears throat> main areas that we really help people with. Um, and again, if it's cool with you, Jeremy, I'll just share the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. the, the link because uh, on this call, we can do it a lot more justice than today, but we typically kind of help people with four things like, whoopsies, like one is um, their offer. So like how to kind of charge, you know, like I was talking about that, like five, uh, five to 15 K um, for an offer, like for say three to six months of coaching and like how to structure that and set that up. Second mm -hmm. thing is really like the lead generation, making sure you're getting enough booked calls per day and per week where you can kind of create clients without like worrying like, Oh, you know, this one person is like ghosting me or like, I'm like, I sent them a proposal and like, haven't heard back from them. Like we're all about just kind of ramping up conversations, like having, you know, five to 10 calls per day on our calendar and just like never worrying about where more flow will come from. Even today, like a guy that I've worked with for a long time, um, doesn't want to renew. And I'm like, yeah, man, no worries. Like, I don't have to worry about that because we got a new client today. We got two new clients on Thursday. So it's just like that abundance experience from having a lot of leads coming in. Um, mm -hmm. We're really big on sales. Um, we're very good at like, just again, relationship based, very chill sales approach is kind of what we take. We're just trying to figure out like if they're a good fit and if it makes sense and like why they're not signing up. Is it money? Is it fear? Is it something else? Is it like a spouse that's kind of like blocking their growth? So I've done a lot of um, training in that arena. We definitely help people with that. And then the last kind of thing we help people with is I call it either scale or fun. So for me, what I really like to do is surf. And so like, you'll see, I have like the surf beach cameras pulled up all the time. And I'm like, all right, how do I get out and paddle out? Because I live <laughs> here in San Diego, but I also kind of match it up with my calendar. You know, so what I'm doing very often is um, I'm trying to work nine to one like four days a week you know like this is like one hour of calls and then i'm done all day friday i'm done 1 p.m and i've really set up a system where kind of my team is like doing a lot of the coaching for me so if we have say like 40 50 clients like i may be coaching 10 percent of those people just to stay fresh stay in the game it helps remind me of like oh okay you know i'm i need to keep coaching people just for my own sanity like it fills my cup and, but also I can continue to experience the challenges of like working with different people and like the stress and like that experience. So I'm not always just telling my team, like, you got to do this with this client. Like, I'm like, oh, okay, I can have more compassion because I'm also in the trenches. But the fourth thing we really help people with is like, what do you want? Do you want to just kind of convert this to passive income and scale it? Do you want to work more, build out a team? Like, what is your kind of game plan long-term look like? Is it Again, is it the um, four hour work week? Is it you want to build more of like a consulting company and like have five coaches underneath you? For me, I like the kind of 100K a month, four person team model where I grow a lot of leadership. But I also have a lot of time off. I can have fun. I can travel. I can focus on my podcast. And it just really depends. Like this is a skateboard from Beaver Fleming, um, professional skateboarder. I just had Alex Trebek on my podcast, or not Alex, obviously he passed away from Jeopardy. But his wife, um, Jean Trebek, just came on the show. So what we do is like, you know, we help kind of fix the money problem. And then if you want to scale and make more and do more, great. But also if you want to use this as a means to also something else like a book or a channel on podcasts, like we help people with that too. Yeah, awesome. Um, cool. That's all the questions that I have on my list. Uh, I've loved our engagement. This was so much fun. Uh, an awesome engagement from our community in the chat and asking questions. Uh, Brandon, thank you a ton. Um, I've seen a couple members of the practice community out here commenting as well. Thank you all for joining. If anyone is curious about practice, uh, Brandon even talked about some of the things that we help coaches solve, like stringing together these advanced workflows and automations and stuff like that. Uh, check us out, practice.do. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you're curious or have any questions. Um, but thank you all for joining. We'll share the recording of this after the fact in case anyone missed the beginning, middle, or end. Um, enjoy your day. Thanks so much for joining and, um, we'll see you guys next time. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care, everyone.